uh, went into a bar and ordered for three glasses of beer. And the, the bartender sucked him. He grabbed his glasses and went and sat into a table by himself and started taking the, the glasses, the, the beer in these glasses. Each glass at a time, he would take a sip from one glass, put it down, and then pick another glass and take a sip. And get the third one and take a sip and then he gets to the first one again and he did that until the three glasses were empty and so he went back to the counter for a refill and the bartender asked him like why are you doing that wouldn't it just be better to order one bottle at a time like just have a bottle open you take it it's done and then it's like well you see i have two brothers one is in australia and one is in melbourne and um but before we all separated of course i'm here in texas we had our last drink together, and we agreed that whatever we would be, we would be doing this. So I am taking one glasses for myself and two are for my brothers. And wherever my brothers are, they're doing the same for me. Like, wow, okay, that's, that's so thoughtful of you. And so everyone else laughed, and he continued with his, you know, taking his beer. And so he became a regular. So every day he would come, every week he would come. Just does the gets three glasses and takes and until he's done and he goes home. And then one day he came and just ordered for two glasses. And he went and everyone was quiet and just looking at him. He took his two glasses and he was done with the two glasses. He came for a refill and the bartender looked at him and said, Sir, I don't want to meddle in your personal life, but I just wanted to offer my condolence. Sorry for your loss. And the guy looks at the boy and he's like, what, what loss? What do you mean? He's like, you and your brother. You lost a brother. You've always had three glasses, one for yourself and two for the other brothers of yours. And today it's just two that mean you've lost someone. He's like, no, no, all my brothers are okay. They're doing well. So why only two? He's like, well, I got saved. And I'm now in a Baptist church, but my brothers are not yet saved. So the one that is not there is for me because I'm now saved. But the two are for my brother, so I'm still taking for them and on their behalf. And they're like, okay, that is something. And, and so this man is pretending to be something he's not. This man is desiring to have the blessing that comes from being in Christ, but is not willing to let go of the pleasures of the world. He wants to be part of a body of Christ, but he is not willing to let go of the fellowship that the world offers. And yet the Bible tells us the two cannot be in the same place. You cannot have light and darkness. And as the story we're going to read in the Bible tells us of some people who were living their life in pretense. And so open your Bible, if you will, to Acts chapter 5, and we will read and see this story. But I want us to begin... Uh, with verse 36 of chapter 4 to see how the story unfolds. So Acts chapter 4, verse 36 says, Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought, to the, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias, with his wife, Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds, and brought only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land, while it remained unsold? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young man rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Oh yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? 
Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed his last. When the young man came in, they found her dead. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them. But the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on courts and mats, that as Peter came by, at, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and this, those who were afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Lord, we thank you for the reading of your word. And we pray that you use it to speak to us. And we pray that you help us learn and respond in obedience to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I just told you a story about this man, this Texan man, who wanted to continue with the pleasures of the world, continue with being part of what the world offers, but he at the same time wanting to be part of a fellowship, wanting to be part of the body of Christ. And, and you can now balance that. Now we see something happening in the life of Ananias and Sapphira and, and it's something for us to learn from. And the title, by the way, for this someone is pretending to be. Pretending to be something you're not, if you want to fill it on. But there are a lot of things we're going to see in the life of this man and his wife. And what we learn from Ananias and Sapphira is what commitment is, unfortunately, for a wrong cause. This man and his wife were so committed and they were devoted to lying and, and they were professionals at that. But what leads to what we've just read is pretense. Wanting to live a life that was not their own. Wanting to be someone they were not. And therefore trying to do what they could not. You see, it begins in chapter 4 where we were told the believers were giving what they had. Others were selling their properties. Others were bringing the little money they had so that the needs of the church was met. And we saw last Sunday the church we should be is a church that meets the needs of its members. And we saw these guys were doing it. And the last thing we see is Joseph, who is called Barnabas, sold land and brought the money before the congregation and say, here is my gift to the church. All right, and people that praise God, right? Now, Ananias and Sapphira is like, oh, I think we also need to be on the spotlight. We need to be known. And when you read the story and follow, it appears that they had made a public declaration. Well, my wife and I, we have a land. We're going to sell it and bring the money to also support the needs of the church. Why did they do that? Because they saw someone else did it. Now, I've, I've mentioned this before. How many of you have ever uh, attended a wedding meeting? And well, the pleasures and things like that are happening. Then you probably, hopefully you survived this, but so many times we have ended up making pleasures of things that we were not ready to do. Someone goes with a 20,000. And of course, that's what it has like. This was my contribution. And then you get there, as people are, you know, making pledges, this one says, I am contributing 500,000 towards this occasion. Chairman like sexual right that. And someone is like, I'm giving 450,000. I'm giving 300. I'm taking the food. Oh, that's, that might be like 3 million. And then you begin like, what can I do with my 20,000? Now, I'm, I'm going to say 20,000. And then, because you want to be on the same platform with the rest. Now, remember the rest were giving 200 or 3 or 4. They are in position 2. So now you want to be just like them. And what do you say? Well, I am taking all the soldiers. <laughs> Chairman, write my name. All the soldiers. And those are 
drift a crate. And then you get back home with it. Just on the way to it, like, praise God, thank, thank you for your support. You don't have a word to say. Because out of the 20 you had, your transport was coming out of that as well. But now you've pledged to cover 50 crates of sodas. Four months salary to be able to take care of that. Where will I get that? And then as days draw closer, FBI cannot find you. <laughs> the chairman begins looking for you, the secretary, the treasurers, and everyone, CIA, CMI, FBI, Men in Black, Jack Bauer, all of those guys, Jack Ryan, none of them can get you. Your phone is off. Why? Because you made a promise. You knew you cannot keep. You got involved in something only for a face. You wanted to make a face. You wanted people to see you and know you. And you wanted to be at a certain level that you were not. And we landed ourselves in trouble always doing that. This is what's happening with Ananias and Sapphira. You see, they see Joseph has sold the property. Of course, we're not told whether that was his own property, but he sold his property and brought the money. we in good faith to support the ministry. Now, this man and his wife sees like, okay, I think people should also know we have done something. And there was, there's nothing wrong in wanting to do something, but whatever you're doing, you do it within your means, right? Now, the promise of self. And so the first pretense we see is they pretend to be generous. Just like he sold, well, we're, we're also going to sell. No, don't worry, we're only going to sell. But we're told when they sold the land, the money came. Oh my goodness, I've got to give all of this 50 million. No, this is too big. Can we divide in half and take half and keep half for ourselves? But we will tell them this is what came out of the land. You see, the foundation of the giving was wrong. The motivation for the giving was wrong. The desire for why they wanted to give was wrong. But we see that in their pretense to be generous, they ended up withholding something. They, they held some things back. Now I want to ask, what is it that you're holding back from God? It could be a promise you made to could be a commitment to something. could be a pledge. You made a pledge, well, I am going to do this, and now you're running away from it. could be a call that God has placed in your life and a gifting that follows it, and you've been trying to just run away from doing that. What, what are you holding back from God? See, that's... It, at the end of it all, it does not matter what we've given. What matters most is the motive behind the giving. But also, by the way, God does not judge us when it comes to giving out of what we've given. He judges us based on what is left after we've given. That's, that's where the evolution comes from. That's why Jesus, when, he saw, when people were giving in the temple, he said, that woman, the widow who gave only two coins, and said she's the best giver ever. Why? Because she's given everything she had. Now others were coming with full sacks of coins and throwing it in the coffer. Take a minute as the coins are ringing in the coffer. Well, the giving... Now, imagine someone has one billion and then he gives one million. Is he feeling the pinch? No. But if someone has 1,000 and is given 900 shillings, he's left with one. Who of the two has given sacrificially? Most times we turn and say, man, this guy gave one million, he's, he's sacrificed. But when you look at what he's given with what has remained, that's a balance. 
sometimes that's what that's how we give sadly we give balance to God on a Sunday morning we begin looking for I left my fidel did you see my I left my coins here yesterday I need that coin I went and they gave me there, there was 100 and there were two 100s and then each one there are 400 supposed to be here and where where is it and then they turned the house upside down looking for the balance of the coin so he can come and give. Sometimes we do that. You see, but sometimes we are in trouble and we put ourselves in that spot because we are trying to compare ourselves with others. And I've said this before, I want to say this. See, God has not called you to be that person. God has called you to be you. My brother Matt, God has called you to be man, and he's gifted you as man to do what he's purposed you to do. Not Roy. But so many times we try to reinvent the wheel. We try to see what others are doing and want to duplicate it, want to compare ourselves with them, or be like them, or be better than them. See, if God wanted you to be that person or be like that person here, would have made you that person. But he made you you for a reason. And he's gifted you with the gift he's given you for a reason. And we need to be faithful in seeking and trusting him with that gift that he's given. The reason why there's so much fight in the body of Christ, in the ministry, and the, the different among the different organizations, is people fail to acknowledge the call that God has placed in their life and the gifting he's given to them for that call and they're trying to compare. And so because this organization is doing this and it's doing it's, it's taking happening well. And of course, as long as we're being faithful in serving God and in doing what he's called us to do, it's going to prosper. God is going to bless it because at the end of it all, it's not our work, it's his. But what happens? Now it's like, okay, I think that works. I think we need to begin doing that as well. Well, God has not called you to do that. He's called you to do what he's given you. But once we begin trying to be like others and compare ourselves with them, we are in trouble. Because one, you lose your identity. Because for me to become mad, I have to stop being Jacob. And so I can become him. For me to begin living like him, I have to stop being me and be like him. And then I become scarred face. Okay, so any of you watch Batman? Two so face, the limb guy, scar face, yeah. Where it's one face, but another face is inside. And what people see is not you. Suddenly many people are living a lie, living lives that are not theirs. Now I want to ask, whose life are you living? Just think about it for a moment. Are you living your life? The life that God has purposed for you. Living in His will and serving the purpose He's called you to be. There are many young people probably even here who are not who they are. They are Bobby Wine. There are many here who are Lil Wayne. There are many here was 50 cent Curtis Jackson the many here were Michael Jackson the moonwalker and now there are many here who have versatile taken on a fictitious character they're Jack Bauer <laughs> and you even see the, the writer never said Jack Bauer I can run through the ventilator that was a move man but then they try to leave and do everything just like that person and then their identity is gone. There are many who are Spice Diana. There are many who have become Zinka. There are many who have become Bad Black. When Butcherman was the most popular guy, there were many who became Butcherman. Now, there are many people who don't know why Butcherman works like this. It's because he's not balanced on one side, okay? Now, people thought that was just a way of life. It's like, you walk like this. 
And of course, you know, those guys are with, with drugs. So here is full of leaves, the weaves, cigar weave. And so it also pulls the trouser down. And now Butcherman, the trouser is down because the pocket is full of weaves. And then here's not balanced, and so he's walking like this with trousers down. And people are like, wow, man, that's a good life walking style. <laughs> and so there are very many young people who also started pulling. Now here's empty, so what do they do? Put stones. Or get papers and fold as many papers as they can, so it swells. But also walking. Even the, the talking side, man, how are you doing? Because Butcherman works like that now, Butcherman works like that because he's lame on one side. But everyone is like, man, that is a walking style, and they don't know why the trouser is down, so there's because there's nothing to pull it, they push it. Whose life are you living? Are you trying to live someone else's life? Stop pretending. Pretending, and then secondly, we see they were pretending to be faithful. So Peter asked him. So the guy brings Peter, asks him, like, okay, is this, is this from the sale of the land? Like, yeah, it is. All of it. We brought all of it. I am. That's not even a pen. As it came, I have brought. Peter's like, what? Why are you deceiving your heart to lie? Now let me ask you. Can we lie to God? Now, we know that he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, he's all-knowing, he's all-wise, he's everywhere, he's all-powerful. Can we lie to him? Now that we know he knows everything. Now, this is theology. Can we lie to him? That those who are saying no, and I've seen that those who are not sure but they're saying yes, and that those who are shaking, it's not vertical, it's not horizontal, that those who are shaking this way, it's like, <laughs> it's a slanting. So it's just like a, a half yes and a half no. Can we lie to God? No. Okay. Now let's let's find out. So, how many of us are parents? Okay. How many of us are babysitters? You you take care of maybe as a nanny or something. So at least you work with kids. Have there been a time where you went back home or from wherever you were? And then you find the kids with the sugar here. Or, you know, they've just eaten the beef you had left for supper, for dinner, and the oil is here, the soup. And then you say, John, what happened to the sugar? Why did you, uh, Mama, look, me, I mean, since you left, I've been here, I've not even gone there. Maybe they're right. Are they lying to you? Is it because you don't know? Oh, the thing is, I think the Spirit wants to test and see if you are active and follow it. Hallelujah! So, the kid is lying to you. Is it because you don't know that the one who ate the sugar? You know that the one who ate the sugar, but they're lying. You see, when we talk about lies, Lies is valued and evaluated from the perception of the person telling the lie, not the person to whom the lie is being told. If the person telling lies who is assuming you don't know what they did, even when you know, just like this kid, there's evidence all over and they're just saying, Mama, you know, since you left, I've been here. Maybe they're right. So how about this? What is that? We also don't know. <laughs> I, the big rat took it. And he's a big rat. But so, so, so when Peter says, why have you connived in your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? He's not saying God did not know that Ananias and Sapphira had hidden part of the money. It's, be it's because he is assuming God did not know. And so they're still pretending to be faithful. Well, just like we received it, we've brought it. Here it is. We've been faithful. He's given us what he gave, and we've brought it. And sometimes we're like that. Now, in, in high school, in SST, they taught us, before you cross the road, you look left, you look right, and then you look left again. And then you cross right. 
Now in theology, I want to add something onto your FST. We don't look left and look right only. Look left, look right, look forward, look backward, but look above. Because there's something very important. Don't just look at the surrounding, look up. There's a man who went to town you know, there are places where they have bold writing, do not pee, do not irrigate the wall. <laughs> like clear, and, and there's a fine for irrigating the wall. Do not. And so this man comes, and he's pressed. But he's not willing to spend 300 shillings to go to a washroom facility. <coughs> and so he looks into the corridor. No one is coming. He looks. No one is coming, and he gets right on the wall with the writing. He begins <laughs> irrigating the wall. And then he hears voices like, man, did you read the writing on the wall? <laughs> and man, so this guy only looks this way and looks that way and forgot to look up. And so many times that's how we are. It's not that, praise the Lord. This is um, so many times we're like that. We are looking this way and this way, and like, well, no one's there. Well, we forget to look there. I want to say this before you do anything. Yes, there might not be anyone on this side or this side or either side, but look up, because there's a man who sits above, who does not sleep nor slumber. Who knows who watches and if you know whatever it is will not please him you don't do it we see most time also if it's something that we first have to look this way and look this way and look this way and in a direction to make sure there's no one is always something that's not good <laughs> so if you have to hide don't do it if you're looking, make sure you don't forget above, because there's always someone watching. And if you know he will not love to see you do that, then do it. So an iron sapphire with his wife, uh, this family, this guy, they just sat there like, well, no one will know. This secret is between us. My husband, your secret is safe with me. And the man is like, my wife, your secret is safe with me. And indeed, the secret was safe within them until they die, but they forgot there was a witness, God, the most important person of all, pretending to be faithful. Sometimes we're like that, we pretend. Now, I mentioned this in the first service, one of the most important gifts that God has given to us, out of the many gifts, is the ability not to see what is in, in other people's hearts. We need to appreciate God for that that he did not give us the ability to see what is in the hearts of others. Otherwise, if someone will be talking with you, when in the heart they have a long sword that they're choking you with into pieces, they're saying, oh my goodness, praise God, I can't believe God has done this for you. And it's like, I wish someone would talk them on the way out. <laughs> That's what's happening inside. But out here it's like, oh my goodness, oh God, it's good. But inside, sometimes we pretend to be faithful. But pretending is deadly. The third one we see is pretending to be truthful. Now, you notice that so the man lies, the wife comes, there's an opportunity for, to repent, literally. So Peter asks, of course, Peter has known this. Um, this money that we received here, is that from the sale of the land? Was that everything? And she said, oh yes, that is everything. Pretending to be truthful before God. See, God knows, by the way. Well, we can lie to each other, but God knows. You know, he knows the words we're going to say before we say it. And sometimes we still want to lie to him. That is not. And you, by the way, if you are ever going to lie, to say a lie somewhere, make sure you have a very strong memory. 
that you will never forget the lie you made. Because one lie leads to another lie, to another lie, and then your life is defined by lies. So if you're ever going to lie, well, of course, that's a human being. Maybe you have a strong memory. That you remember the lies you gave 15 years ago. That you meet this person, and like, oh my goodness, I told him this. Oh, yes, <laughs> it's still like that. But we cannot. Lies imprisons you. Lies makes your life difficult. Many men, many women have landed themselves in trouble by lying and trying to be who they're not. And so the man wants to impress this young girl. And so he goes, he borrows money so he, he can go and hire a car. Right? So there's a debt money and then now there's the money to fuel and now you begin you you of course, of course you've lied to this lady now she knows oh this guy he is he works for Mercedes I found a good guy and now each time you meet you have to get money to hire a car right. and then how long will you do that you can't how about when you you cannot get the money anymore when you cannot hire the car what happens a friend's friend had to face a rock like that in Kampala. This is a true story, by the way. He wanted to impress his girl, so he goes and hires a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> I said, this is my car. It's just one of my many cars. Yeah, I, I'm doing what I do business. It's just one of my many cars. And so they go, and uh, you know the the light begins flickering. You know that warning light, which if you're driving, you don't want to see. The tank is empty. <laughs> and so, of course, at least he has the money that he had even borrowed, at least to do fill. And if you know Mercedes Benz, you know it eats. It's a beast, man. And so he gets into the filling station. This guy does not know how to open the fuel tank. Well, from his own car, out of his many cars. So he gets there, so the, the, the guy from the pump is like, just open. <laughs> and, and the lady's like, what's happening? They're waiting for you. And then, of course, now uh, the people are behind are beginning to honk. Because he's quoting John. But the lady's like, what's wrong? He's like, ah, you see, I... Uh, yeah, this, this is my car, but I uh, most times don't drive. I always use a driver. <laughs> so I don't know these things. But the lady had a sensing or something. And so the, the field attendant had to come and like, like, oh, yeah, you see? If the, I even looked there. I just wanted to test your patience. But the lady knew the sense something. And put less fuel, he, had to, he got stuck on the way, and then he got in trouble with the police, that now required the actual owner of the car to come, and that's when he called the actual guy who gave him the car to come, and it did not go well, he lost the girl like that. But see, if he had been honest, like, you know, This lady, I'm telling you, if if you're honest on the onset, the lady, if the lady loves you, she's going to love you for who you are. If this person is going to accept you, it's going to be based on that, without a lie. Mm. Because once it makes them believe in something you're not, now you have to keep on lying, you keep on stealing, or begging, or borrowing, and then there's loan after loan after loan. To maintain a life, you cannot. And maybe you might do that for a while, but to do that the rest of your life is impossible. The reason why we hear a lot from some is like, this person has really changed, I don't understand them anymore. Because they have suddenly regressed back to who they truly were, not who they maybe believe they are. And uh, two different personalities. If you fall in love with 50 Cent, Suddenly, 50 cent is gone. 
and you have Chichi Chamugo from <laughs> Kai Chabawala. Okay, come on, remind me. Be yourself, man. Pretend that it's bad. But we see something that happens. But you notice that these guys were in a church. These guys were part of the church. And so just because somebody is in a church does not mean they're believers. Does not mean they're living and walking right with God. Sometimes it's not. We have a lot of walls and sheep's clothing. We see chapter 2 tells us they devoted themselves to the teaching and preaching of the word. These guys were being chill leaders like, yes, yo, preach it, brother. But not for me. When they say, we need people who can do this, they're like, bro, have you heard? They say they need people to do this. Not for them. But because God did this, something happened. While many signs and wonders were being done, the teaching of the word is happening, the numbers are increasing. Verse 30 tells us the rest of the people dare not to come back. The pretender says, okay, this is not a joking subject, like God would always say, that he's not a joking subject. It's not a place to be. We should be so thankful to God that God's day is so gracious to us, man. He's so gracious that even as we, we, we live all of this pretending life, we, we lie, we steal, we... God is so gracious. If this that happened in the first century church was to happen today, we might not have, I might not have anyone to preach to. And you guys might not even have a pastor to preach to you. We need to be grateful to God. But we see that the rest of the body of believers were remaining strong in unity. We're told they were the rest were together. While others were fleeing, they were together. The pretenders left. But the people were getting saved. The teaching and the preaching of the word of God. You see, when there's faithful teaching and preaching of the word of God, that's what it does. It gets to a point where someone feels like, I cannot pretend anymore. I think I cannot either continue staying here or I need to change my life. Pretending is not good. There's a there's a man who his time for getting married came and he went to a church and got a lady very beautiful. She was here. Lady Vivian Washington. And she became pastor's wife. And he stayed for a long time and one time as the pastor was preaching after he made the altar call. First person to come in front with his wife for salvation. And first thing, well, I'm calling people who want to give their life to Christ. It's like, I'll explain later. <laughs> and so other, others came and followed. And when they got home, I was like, why did you behave like that today? It's like, no, I, I've never been saved. I, I love singing, and so I went to, to the side of the church because there was great singing and great music, and good enough for me. I was able to join the worship team. That's how I started singing. But I never made confession of Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior until today. Stop pretending, guys. Let us stop pretending. Be who you've been called to be. Be the real you. Don't be a man you're not. Don't be a woman God has not made you to be. Don't try to be who you're not. I, but this is what I want us to do as we pray, get ready to pray. Church, don't hold anything back from God. Let us not hold anything back from God. Fulfill the promise you've saved, you men. And I say this, I want to say to us, don't ever make a promise or decision when you're so excited or when you're too angry. Those moments are not good. When you're so excited, when you're too full, you just finish eating a full burger. Don't make a promise. <laughs> when you have a full light pizza in front of you, don't make a promise. Out of that excitement. And when you're so angry, 
someone has annoyed you, you're angered to the point that you don't react, don't make a decision out of that. Wait until you've cool. Wait until the adrenaline has re get gotten back to normal. Wait until the anger has released. Then act. Because so many times we have landed ourselves in trouble by making promises and or doing things based on the circumstances and it's not true. Better stop pretending. And I want to ask this as we go home. What have you been pretending to be that you're not? Who have you been pretending to be that you're not? And whatever it is, like, allow God through His Word and His Spirit to filter those things out, to point those areas in your lives that you've been pretending about. And as He does that, be willing and obedient to respond to Him and allow Him do the work he wants to do in you so that he can work through you. Allow him to continue molding you, shaping you into the man and the woman he's purposed you to be. And don't ever try to live a life that's not yours. Don't ever try to be a man or a woman you're not. As far as it depends on you and me, let us trust God and serve him. Be faithful. Seek him. Give to the best of your ability, but not because you're comparing, you're trying to outdo, you're trying to compete with someone. Be faithful to God. If the best that you can give to God is a 10,000, give it joyfully. God honors that. But if you bet the best you can give is a 100,000, don't give 10,000. Don't hold anything back. Trust God with all you are. Leave the rest to him. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 15, said, Do your best to present yourself unto God as approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed of the gospel, but the one who correctly handles the word of truth. Do your best to present yourself to him. Let him be the one to approve. And as God leads, trust him, seek him, serve him. It doesn't matter what others say. Let people say, I can't believe. The whole of him can only give that. If that's the best you can do, go back joyfully knowing you've done the best God has called you to do. But don't hold anything back. But if you'll forget anything, don't forget this. Don't pretend to be someone or something you're not. You're not. Don't become Oliver Quinn. And take on a hood and become something. Be you. Because God has called you to be you. He's gifted you to be you. And he wants to use you, not the other person you want to be. Let us stop trying to be one of these. And be who God has called you to be. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for the reminder from your word. We got to admit that we're all guilty. I am. A lot of times, I've tried to do things that I could not do. I've tried to be or not, and then just try to look good. God, I pray that you help us respond to you here and now. Search us, Lord. Search our hearts. And see if there's anything in our hearts that's standing on the way of us knowing you. And you remove it. That if there are things that we've been trying to do just to please others, just so that we're known, that we'll stop it and do things to please you. Because your word tells us you hate pride and that pride comes before a fall and that those who try to lift themselves up, you, God, humble them down. And it's the one who will humble before you are the ones you'll lift up. May we in all humility seek you and live for you and you alone. Help us trust you. Help us serve you with our lives and the resources you've given to us. But as we do that, help us and remind us not to hold anything back from you. Remind us of the promises we've made, pledges we've made, the commitment we've made that maybe we've not fulfilled yet. And help us be men and women who keep the promises we've made because we serve a God who keeps his promises. Guide us as we go through this week and continue reminding us and help us search our hearts and our lives. And if there's anything in it, 
that does not honor you. As you take it. Break our hearts, Lord, for what breaks yours. And help us leave. Break glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and sing our last song together. Keep on reflecting on these questions. Don't leave here and go through this week while still pretending to be the man you're not. Pretending to be a woman you're not. Pretending to be a person you're not. Be you. God has created you to be you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And what God says about you should matter more to you than what anyone else says. And that's what God has said about you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And He loves you the way you are. Let that be enough for you to trust Him with your life. To trust Him with what He said about you. Shall we sing together?